No, only socialist choice, only socialist federation, only socialist pluralism. But it makes no sense at all. That's why his commitment is to the quick fix of the same uh, uh, socialist structure which failed. His commitment is to the reform of uh, socialist uh, system in the Soviet Union which will never work. So I must say that he is not for reform, but against it. How do you see that? Well, is he, is, is, uh, do you see with the, the referendum on the side now and everybody continuing to clamor for economic reform that the central government is going to move, wants to, and is going to move towards economic reform, to, a, to what would be regarded as reform here, a free market system? Well, unfortunately, in our country, the leaders are still afraid of the word capitalism and market economy. They think that they can do a, a controlled market economy and it doesn't work and people are tired already and uh, you can, uh, we say that you can't jump uh, through the river in two jumps you'll either you do it or you don't so right now we're like in the middle of nowhere but i think gorbachev has a chance there are lots of smart economists that are just waiting for him to you know to give them a chance to try does this having this referendum under his belt now give Gorbachev a new opportunity to attempt reform. Uh, he has this opportunity, but we are speaking about the same. It's necessary to separate two things, economy and ideology. Uh, economy is science. Ideology is a very nice thing, it's possible to talk about, but necessary to believe that economy will be done by economists. We still have party, old retired party leaders who still teach us how to organize industry. They destroy it five, six times uh, in our uh, memory. But they still teach us. It's necessary to make economy a science. And all economists are pushed out from Gorbachev's team and start to be replaced by old party bureaucracy. So it's very are, dangerous. Do you agree with Miller Stura then that, yes. that uh, Gorbachev has embraced or been captured by the people? who don't want I, free market reform. Yes, I think he start to be, uh, he start to be uh, human shield. He, they uh, start to use him. And in this way, surrounded by old style uh, uh, tough liners, uh, he cannot do what he like. I really believe that he won't reforms. But he's still speaking about ideology more than about economy. And he still trying to understand will it be capitalism or socialism and we have not meat and bread. And it's necessary to make production and not to discuss the empty things. I see. So um, I gather from n none of you is very hopeful that things are going to get very, uh, very much better very soon. You wouldn't think so. May I add one thing? Uh, if you can do it very briefly, Miller. Yes. We, we spoke quite thoroughly about the economy, but the main problem nowadays is the nationalities problem. And despite this referendum, the quest for independence and sovereignty, the centrifugal forces are so strong that even the results of the referendum will never give Mr. Gorbachev chance to keep the old imperial structure intact. Okay, we have to leave it there. Melo Stora, uh, Yolena Hanga, and Vitaly Karadzic, thank you. Judy? Still ahead on the news hour, war correspondent Peter Arnett, a Kuwaiti hostage freed from Iraq, and lessons from the war. Iraq. They are told by an American, the only Western journalist to spend the entire war in Baghdad, and by a Kuwaiti citizen who was taken hostage by Iraqi troops. We start with the journalist, Peter Arnett of the Cable News Network. He was both criticized and praised for the way he reported on the impact of the war on Iraq. And this afternoon, Arnett talked about his experiences at the National Press Club. When I arrived in Baghdad uh, from Jerusalem just a few days before the war uh, began, I discovered uh, that there was no finely honed Iraqi information organization that was uh, controlling our professional lives there. Basically, there were a group of conscripts from the Baghdad Observer newspaper, the English language newspaper, and from the information ministry, and they were assigned to handle the international press, and they were completely overwhelmed. Now, some of these individuals our senses, 
had graduated from Western universities in Scotland and in Germany, and they were generally in their late 30s, early 40s. Most, I discovered, were not in Saddam Hussein's uh, Ba'ath Socialist Party. They entertained healthy reservations about the regime, and these became clear the longer I stayed, yeah, particularly as the bombing campaign revealed the increasing impotency of the government. Some of uh, these whom we called uh, our minders were diplomats expelled from Washington or Paris. Uh, when, the, when, the, when the embassies were closed, they were generally amiable, uh, sophisticated, all lived at the El Rashid Hotel. Their families were uh, long distance from Baghdad. They had no contact from IC with their families. There were no phones. Uh, most of them, they spent every night in the bunkers downstairs because of the bombing. And each night as part of, the, uh, as part of my, uh, my relationship with them, I'd go down with a few bottles or whatever I could find in CNN's ample storage uh, rooms and hand them around and, and talk long into the night. I mean, we were basically, they were gregarious, amiable, amen and, and amenable to discussion when it came to coverage. I think a coverage breakthrough that I made came early in the game when uh, finally I was all alone. And we had the in my set phone. I had a set of instructions how to run it. Myself and Mr. Sadoon dragged the phone out into the yard. Uh, in the evening, it was a chilly night. It was dark. I had a flashlight, and I had uh, I'd fashioned a brief approved script that I'd written about a visit to Baghdad that day. So uh, I read it over the, uh, over the air, and uh, anchorman Reed Collins, at the conclusion of it, said, uh, he said, uh, ask me some questions. Well, what was it? You know, how did it look? What about this, that, or the next thing? And I was chatting to him and talking for about 15, 20 minutes, and Mr. Sadoon was listening. At the end, he said, who are you talking to? <laughs> and I said, Reed Collins. And he says, not Eason Jordan, because he knew Eason Jordan, and he knew that we only did business with Eason. I said, no, he was the anchor man. Well, who's an anchor man? I explained. He says, you mean you were on the air? How <laughs> one? But that was the breakthrough, because later we discussed it at night. He, he brought the other minders around, and we, we, we talked of this. He said, but there's no censorship. How can we do this? I talked to him about the need for credibility. That was the important factor. I said, there was no point in me being in Baghdad if all that I could deliver each evening was a brief approved dispatch. I had to have the question A, had to have the Q&A. And by miracle of miracles, I was able to get through to them. So they accepted it. What would it be a typical question B? I made a note of a couple of them here. Bob Kane, our anchor, would be on the line. He said, I'd go, I'd been to Basra and, Basra and I'd say there was no, I could not talk about any military information at all. And he'd say, Peter, on the road to Basra was there much military traffic? Uh, you know, there was there much military traffic? And I said, well, Bob, there was much traffic on the highway and but very little of it was civilian. But on the <laughs> other hand, <laughs> then he'd say things like, Peter, are the Iraqis moving tanks and and anti-aircraft emplacement into civilian areas. And I remember saying, Bob, if I was to answer you uh, what I know about that question, I'd be pulled off the air. So, a little more subtle. Uh, we were able to chart the increasing, well, the rapid deterioration of Iraqi society and the frustration of the average man on the street and eventually the very negative comments of the, of the minders themselves. Uh, they were increasingly uh, unhappy. I mean, the whole CNN crew were being pulled aside in hallways and, and uh, given you know, complaints about what was going on in the government. We had to be very careful about how we handled all this information. My concern, it was, it was uh, agents provocateurs uh, making up remarks. It was an attempt to test us. It was always each day, you know, how much of this information can we go with? How much could we prove? Uh, that, was the cr that was the criteria. Uh, eventually, uh, the final, uh, the ultimate of all this maneuvering, discussion, and uh, to a certain amount, freedom came in the last night when we were eventually told that CNN had to depart Baghdad with the rest of the press corps. This was about uh, several days after the war ended. I was waiting to go on live in the Al Rashid Garden to talk about this at 11 o'clock at night. And uh, Frank Cesno was uh, summing up the news developments over the audio. I was listening to him. And uh, a minder arrived. He was a young man. He was a Christian. I talked to him before. He was concerned about the fate of his minority and the, and the, and the future.
And I turned to him and I said, uh, look, I'll be very, I'm going to be very frank tonight. This is my last broadcast. I'm sorry, but I will be frank. And he sort of looked at me and backed off. And as we started to talk, he just looked into the middle distance, into the sky. And Frank says, no, ask me questions like, uh, uh, one was, uh, what about the... Uh, what about the bunker, Frank said. And you're about to leave. Tell us about that so-called civilian bunker. And I was able to say, well, the hot rumor here is that Saddam Hussein was in it two hours before it was hit, but I can't prove it. Another question, is there any unrest in Baghdad? And I was able to say, well, you, we've got unconfirmed reports. There's blood in the streets earlier today. And the minder was looking into the middle distance, and on we went for 35 minutes of it. And finally it was over, and I walked over to him, and I shook his hand, and he sort of smiled at me, and and uh, walked off into the middle distance, and that was that. For the record, the Persian Gulf War was the 17th war covered by Peter Arnett. He won the Pulitzer Prize as an Associated Press reporter for his coverage of the Vietnam War. Two weeks ago in Kuwait, correspondent Charles Krauss interviewed Salwa and Badria al Ghani, members of one of Kuwait's wealthiest and most prominent families. At the time, Salwa's brother, Mahmoud, a businessman, had been taken hostage by Iraqi soldiers. He was one of thousands of Kuwaiti men and teenage boys who'd been rounded up by the Iraqis in the final days of the war. Mahmoud al Ghanim was later released, and this is his story. Mahmoud al Ghanim is one of the lucky ones. He's now been reunited with his sister Sawa and other members of the al Ghanim family. But several thousand other Kuwaiti hostages are still in Iraqi hands. Their fate is unknown. Before his release, al Ghanim was held hostage 14 days, most of that time at a military training camp near Basra in southern Iraq. What did you know? when you were kept in that military training ground, of, of what was happening outside there. First of all, what did you know with regard to the final days of the war? We didn't know what was uh, happening. We heard uh, the bombing, which was very close to us. We were hoping that the satellites had picked up uh, uh, the transfer buses and knew where our location uh, was uh, surviving that the second day bombing got closer to us and we understood from one of the guards that a, a battleship called Missouri was bombing so we thank God that <laughs> we were not uh, uh, you know affected uh, by it and uh, somehow we had really a belief in uh, the American technology in having spotted us. But the third day, when the civil uh, war started, that was a scare. That was really scary because the Republican army was partly stationed no more than half a kilometer from where we were, and heavy artillery was exchanged between the Republican army and the opposing, uh, opposing forces in Basra. During that period, we had very little contact with the rest of the world. And what were conditions like in that camp? Terrible, the least to say. Uh, we occupied the space no more than uh, 60 square uh, centimeter, which is uh, in feet, four square foot. We were alternating uh, sleeps. No food, no water, and actually the results today came of the test. Total dehydration of our system. Many got sick with dysentery. Uh, no facilities, uh, toilet facilities. The whole human element uh, with these forces uh, was not existent. They really seemed to be enjoying what they were doing. They were worse than the, the Gestapo's, uh, as we've seen them uh, in Hollywood movies. When did you first realize that there was fighting between the Republican Guard and other units of the Iraqi army? When, when in effect, did you realize a civil war was, was beginning? When the bombing stopped, 
and the artillery started. And we knew that if it was the Allied forces camping right outside our camp, they could have freed us. That not taking place, we knew then the forces were fighting. The Iraqi forces were fighting. There have been reports, conflicting reports, out of Basra. Uh, at one point, it seemed that the opposition was doing well. Then, more recently, the reports are that the Republican Guard seems to have taken control of the city back from, from the opposition. What is your sense? Uh, we heard an estimate from some people who were at, at the hospital that on the first day of the fighting, some 5,000 people died. And the, the pharmacist friend of ours who had taken the sick to that hospital saw what the perimeter of Basra looked like. It was just skeletons. You know, all the walls were, the more homes were demolished, uh, smoke coming uh, from every place. But the bombing continued for, for five, five days. days. Heavy. And then there was a lull. And then, it kept, and then there was sporadic. In so we assumed that the opposition was crushed. When you were brought back to Kuwait, by the Iraqis. You were dropped off at the border. At the border. Mm -hmm. And there was no one there to receive you, as I understand it. And in fact, there have been accounts that um, many of the men who were with you became quite angry. How did you feel about that? Well, I, 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 our main goal was to get out of the Iraqi territory. So when we saw the little American flag at the border point, even though we were in an open truck, it was cold, open desert, it didn't really matter. But they were not ready for us because they claimed that they were not informed. They could have set up a, a more appropriate uh, accommodation in the form of tents because we were kept in the same clothes. We had not taken showers for two weeks. We were filthy. And, uh, and we had, we, a lot of us were sick. And so it was rather disappointing. But amazingly, you see, we had taken it with a good heart, but when it took over eight, nine hours, and then asked so many questions, even after presenting our documents, uh, some of us had, had lost their documents, so uh, frustration started. So about 200 of us protested and started walking that distance from the border to Kuwait City, which frankly I don't blame them. And uh, I truly feel that uh, our government should have been more ready for us to receive us. Do you think this government is, is, is demonstrating is failing in the situation. This government is not only demonstrating its total incapability to deal with the situation, but unfortunately is trying to dictate its own terms of how to deal with the reconstruction of Kuwait. In other words, dealing with the mentality of abundance as Kuwait was before the invasion dealing with the same mentality of reconstructing Kuwait. And this cannot be. This just cannot be. Uh, if you ask anybody on the street, any Kuwaiti who has stayed behind and defended this country, he will tell you he has no faith, none whatsoever, with the present government. You got back from the border when? Friday morning? Friday morning, yes. After uh, a 14 uh, hour journey that covered 135 kilometers.
What did you say to Salvo when you first saw him? Uh, big hugs, <laughs> big hugs. And then tell him, here, I'm, I'm still in one, in one piece, maybe totally dehydrated, but uh, still in one piece. Because well, I think we were really lucky that we weren't uh, physically tortured. Maybe the number uh, acted as a preventive against uh, that physical torture. Because, as I said, it was 3,500, 4,000 people. So they couldn't have had the time to uh, torture us physically. So we were the lucky ones in that aspect. We were really lucky. Thank God for that. Thank you, Mahmoud, and welcome home. Thank you, Charles. The Committee for a Free Kuwait says about 1,500 Kuwaiti hostages have been released from Iraq prisons so far. An estimated 7,000 are still being held.